Hey everybody, and welcome to Libromancy, a podcast about the magic of books. Today I'm talking about Jade War by Fonda Lee, the second book in the Greenbone saga. So let's channel the magic of books. Um, we're going to start with a non-spoiler section first. I'm going to try real hard to talk a little bit about it in a non-spoilery way. This uh, is a fine book. It has a really good premise. The thoughts behind it are really good. In practice, I find it a bit inconsistent. I find it a bit rushed and then slowed down and then rushed, where this is a minor spoiler, but it doesn't matter, doesn't affect anything in the book. The book takes place over three years, but you're not given a consistent schedule of time. Sometimes you're like a week and then a year goes by and then another week goes by. And then a week goes by and you're like, whoa, these days are like, we're like one day a month, another day a month, another day. And then it's just like now time and we're jumping ahead. And it's like, whoa, do we need, do we need to jump that far? Like, could we not, like, I just felt like it was very off whenever we jumped more than just a couple days to a week, you know, because jumping from a couple days to a week is kind of normal in, in some books, but in this one, it just never felt right. So if you remember, uh, let's keep going, no spoilers. So the characters I felt all made pretty rational decisions. They all felt pretty true, but I had a lot of issues with just with the characters kind of flip-flopping on each other. And I feel like Fonda Lee kind of pulled some of her punches that she had some scenes that could have been even more impactful and then she pulled them back. So I'm not sure why she did that. But she did. I just don't. I didn't appre- I didn't ex- exactly like a lot of the character choices or this way the plot went. But it was fine. So again, if you like the Jade City, you're gonna like Jade War. It's very similar in tone. The very similar in feel. Just different. And you know, in the future. So let's uh, let's get into our spoiler section here because because I've run out of things to talk about without spoiling anything. So let's just talk the book. The first book ends with Hilo and Anden, you know, killing the Horn of the Mountain and kind of forcing a bigger truce on the No Peak Clan and the Mountain Clan. Now, I still think that these books would be way more enjoyable to follow if we were following the Mountain Clan. To me, the Mountain Clan is like the epitome of like what a true mafia family is. You have the incredibly strong head. You know, it would be a little better, I guess, if if Ait uh, had a family. But she doesn't so. But she's a strong head. She keeps her people in line with fear and with her power. And she doesn't tolerate traitors. And I'm not saying the No Peak Clan tolerates traitors. But, like, I just don't feel that they epitomize, you know, the mafia with magic to me. They are too engrossed in in their family struggles, which is normal. And it sounds weird when I'm saying it and complaining about it, but I think the mountain is the way to go. If in my mind, the mountain would win the challenge because they've been one to two steps ahead of the no peak clan the whole time. And here is, let's, let's bring up one of my first complaints with Hilo. Hilo is a good character. He was the horn and now he has to be the pillar and he's, you know, coming more into his own role here. But like, he just makes some really bad decisions that he's just like, oh yeah, I have to do this. It's necessary. And it's like, really? It was necessary? You had to do that? Like, he goes, they've been, he's been talking with his, with Lan's wife, or ex-wife, and he goes over there to talk, and then he kills her and kidnaps her son because, oh, he deserves to f- taste green and be part of the family. And it's like, that's, you, you just killed somebody for nothing. Like, straight up, cold-blooded murdered her just because. Like, you also got kicked out of Uwiwa, and you can never go back to Uwiwa. Like, you are alienating yourself. He is too hot-headed. And so he flip-flops. He's like, oh, you know, anything for the clan. Oh, and except for this, I'm going to, you know, kill my, my sister-in-law because she won't let my nephew be join a gang. Oh, heaven forbid that happened. But I just did not like the decisions that he made a lot of the time. He, he has so much honor usually. You know, he won't go after people who aren't wearing jade. He takes care of things. But when, and we'll talk about Shay's duel later, but when Shay's in the duel with Ait, he is prepared 100% to murder everybody if she loses and dies, you know, regardless of clan politics or warfare or like normal ways of doing things. He's just straight up ready to break all of his honor for it. It's like, what? What? It's just something you propose that you are, you know, you like and you 
true and believe? You're just going to break it all? Like, in a prescribed fight that you that you agree with? Like, I just, I did not like that. I just thought it was too flip floppy. All right, let's talk about, I want to save Shay for a little bit. So let's talk about Beru. Well, the plot armor is thick with Beru. He does survive so many things this time still. It's crazy. I thought it was a good plan of him to to steal the jade off of Lan's corpse in the grave when they're burying, you know, their grandfather. But what? they didn't think like, hey, you know, we buried all that jade. Maybe we should post a guard, even just like a low level finger, you know, somebody to watch out who has jade, can't be bought off while we've got this. Yeah, you know, just like, really? Like, we didn't like bury, dig the hole, bury him, and then it was all done. Whatever. I'm glad they figured it out that it was stolen. You know, he practices, he practices. And this is something that, you know, slightly bothered me again with the perception. It's super, like, touchy. Like, oh, I can, with perception, I can perceive anybody with Jade in a certain radius of me. Oh, except for this one guy. Or, oh, except for this one time. And, like, I can sense the murderous intent and track them by that. Well, except when it's mood, you know, mud. He can totally trick your perception, which... I know if you can, like, withstrain your killing intent, but, like, Beru is drugged and... Oh, what was it? What happened to him? Yes. He gets hit with a sleeping drug. He gets Jade Withdrawal and Mud injects, over-injects him with SN1 Shine. And, you know, so he will die. And what does all those things do together? Well, apparently they just slow you down enough so that the poison doesn't kill you and you could be saved by an ambulance. You What? <laughs> Really? I, I was really hoping he was dead, but I knew he wouldn't be. And that is part of what I didn't like, because he's just, he, he's he's in it till the end. He, he doesn't do anything of huge consequence, but, you know, his character could be replaced in every instance by somebody else doing the exact same actions, and it really wouldn't change much. But, so, like, in the first book, like, he is the one who shoots Lan and chases him. Well, that could have been done by anybody it didn't have to be Beru. Nothing he had besides the jade fever, which other people have, you know, could have pushed him to do that kind of stuff. But he survives. He goes gambling and he's ready to end it all. And the guy that Hilo saved who lost his arms, you know, kind of rescues him, talks and Beru just starts spilling all of his secrets that he worked with, Zapuno and all these people and they call him and start helping him out. And then they're like, you know, at the end, he's just, he's anti-jade. He's gotten over his jade addiction, which is great. Love it. That was cool, you know, seeing him work there. But now he's anti-clan, even though the clan just, like, saved his life and helped him get a job? Like, what? Why? I, I know why he's so angry about him. But, like, so now he's joining a resistance. It's just like he's always on an antagonistic side. I just... I don't, I don't enjoy it. So, all right, let's start with Wen. I still think Wen is one of the best characters that we get to see. She's dedicated, she's smart, she's diligent, she's thoughtful. I mean, she's just everything you'd want in a good character. You know, I like, you know, she gets pregnant, she has a kid, then she gets pregnant, has another one. That's totally normal. It was all good. She does her spy work where she'll kind of meet with some people and then, like, she's a Drake Jade transporter. But again, this is where I have a little bit of confusion about these kind of things because a Jade or a green bone can sense Jade. So you can be like, aha, that's Jade. But if Wen's holding the Jade, all of a sudden he can't sense it anymore, even though she's not using it, but she's not dampening it either. She can't dampen the the energy or the power of the jade by touching it. She just isn't affected by it at all. But they can sense jade. They 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 can. It's explicit multiple times. They they kind of can sense people's jade that are they're either people are wearing or, you know, if you're holding or you're nearby it. And yet when they're like searching the smuggler ships, they have to like search everything by hand until they figure it out. I just, and that was another thing. So Wen decides to go help Anden kill Zapunio, the smuggler, who has killed her brother. And she, the only way they get the jade in is that she holds the jade. And so when they do their scan with the tool, it doesn't register as jade. And I'm like, well, you know, couldn't, what's his name, just hold the jade? But without, you know, Ron Tan, couldn't he just hold the jade without touching it? Or Anden? Like, if all it needed to do was be in a pen, why did... Why did Wen have to be there for that? Couldn't she have just given the pen to him and he'd hold the pen and then you wouldn't even have to hand it to him. He'd just have it, right? I don't know. I just, I'm sorry if this made sense to you, but it just did not make sense to me. So 
All right, let's talk about Shay. Shay, she was good. She actually did some spying stuff where she's meeting with people in the bathhouse and she's getting the information and she really kind of grows into her role as the weatherman. I loved, loved the scene where she challenges Ite to a fight the, the pillar of the clan and they are going at each other and she's like, I can win this. And then she loses and I was like, okay, that was cool. It was still a good fight. I don't know, I'm a little disappointed she didn't lose. She didn't win, and I'm a little disappointed she didn't die. But, like, it was still a good scene. It was nice. It was dramatic. It really fit. I kind of liked her relationship with Maro, somebody who doesn't want to be a green bone, you know, wears very little, if any, jade. You know, he's a kind of a philosopher and a teacher, and he just, you know, he loves her, and they talk. But then, uh, this is going to be a little graphic, so if you're, uh, well, it's not like graphic graphic, but it's something to watch out for. But it's in the book. She gets pregnant. And then she just immediately chooses to have an abortion. And I understand the reasoning. It's very well thought out. And But she doesn't include him at all in that. And yes, it's her body and her choice. But they are in a relationship together. Those kind of things you should talk about. Just because it's a good thing to talk about with people. And then she purposely does this to drive him away. I just did not. I did not enjoy that part of it. I enjoyed everything else. Yeah, you didn't love the whole love triangle where Woon, her kind of subordinate in the weatherman house or work, you know, was like, hey, I've got a crush on you and I like you. And she's just like, no, I'm sorry. I don't know. And then it made sense, you know, the first time when she met Doru and she couldn't kill him and he kills himself. That part, that didn't, I mean, I was like, yeah, hey, Doro died. Like, that was really hard. Kill the people, the person that nobody likes in the entire book. That doesn't make me feel anything, you know, but good that they actually went through with it. But then after Maru confesses that he got the assassins into the building, or into the compound, but he didn't know what they were going to do. And then she has to mercy kill him. That was so tough. That was a tough one. Like I could feel, I could appreciate her writing that. I don't. I just didn't hit as hard for me. I think maybe they didn't actually have to kill him. I mean, he wasn't. He didn't do it on purpose. I don't know. It was just yes, they had to. So I don't know. I did not. I did not enjoy her mercy killing Maro. But I understood that you know it was about her growth and she was going to be able to figure that out and do it that time. Oh, one notable scene that I really liked is when Mud gets caught by the the fingers and the fists, and then he gets, you know, he meets Hilo, and Hilo's like, oh, you wanted some of the call jade? Well, and here's here's some jade for you, and shoves some jade in his mouth and makes him swallow it. And then they bury him in a metal box with a tube for air coming out and no shine, of course. And then they, they bury him six feet under. That was an intense scene. That's kind of like the mafia scene that I was looking for. You know, like, oh, I'm so sorry. No, no. And they bury him and just, you know, you're going to get the itches. You're going to die. But I, I still had some issues with that. Like, like Hilo takes, he pops out his piercings, basically, or like his, the, his piercings of jade. He like unscrews them and pulls them out. And it, it's, tough it sounds like why wouldn't you just use three random pieces of jade like i get the message like this is our jade this is the call jade but why not just grab some jade and be like this is my jade or like this is my jade but it's like not the ones that's literally embedded in my skin and give that to you know so i was just like that seems unnecessarily painful to yourself so oh but one that's that's let's gonna move to andon now andon Living, and it goes to Espenia to live. He kind of meets a family. He meets a fake Kekanese kind of society of people who are originally from Kekon or kind of grew up here but have Kekanese background. And they've formed their own kind of clan and they have like a, a pillar and a horn. And it's very light and different. And they, you know, he gets in with them and he meets and, you know, it turns out he's gay, which is like, woohoo. But like, I didn't really even know, I didn't even notice that he was in. The first book, to me, it came out of nowhere that all of a sudden he was. Didn't play a huge part in anything, so I wasn't like, hooray. I loved the end that he is going back to Kekon, and he's decided that he will do medical channeling with Jade. He will help people and heal people, but he won't kill people with Jade anymore. And I thought that was a very nice progression through his story, that, you know, he had just killed the Horn in a really backhanded kind of way, and, you know, cheaty way, and then he gets exiled to Kekon, he kind of learns, he grows, and then now he's being brought back, but he'll only do medical, and I was like, that's fine, That's that makes sense for him, I like it. You know, at this time, the clan that he's a part of on Espenia 
is facing a lot of problems from the gangsters of the area. And so they call Shay and he's like, hey, Shay, I want your help. And, you know, Hilo ends up coming out and they work out a distribution to bring some more jade into Espenia, you know, on this, on the off for these gangs. And I'm like, well, again, this is like, this is going against everything you believe. You don't believe in jade for foreigners. And, you know, I totally get what he's saying. They're like, I'll give him this little crap jade. It's uncut. It's fake. It's bad. It's not fake. It's good, but it just, it's not going to be very powerful. It's mostly useless. And then you can watch the gangs tear themselves apart, which does happen, of course, because you knew it would as soon as they introduced the jade. But I just did not. Again, that made Hilo feel a little weird. But Andon is there. He's helping out. And yeah, sure enough, they bring the jade in. The gangs kind of go crazy and start attacking each other for more dominion over it, even though there wasn't much left. And it was kind of crazy. But then, you know, near the end, Hilo, not Hilo, Andon and Wen and Rontar are going to kill Zapunyo who has been this smuggler in their thorn and their side the whole time. And they get away, they kill him, they get away, and then they're caught up to by the gang. And I was like, hey, this is cool. The gang's caught them. They're going to kill them. This is going to be a great ending. And they kill Ronton, which is the kind of green bone that was living on there with them. Kind of the only real gangster kind of guy they had. And then he goes for Wen, and they kill Wen. And then they're killing Anden, and then people show up. Because he was, you know, got a call off. And I was like, oh, that's, that could have been so cool. And like, so much more like mafioso-ish, where like, they just died. You know, nobody knows, or they find them later. And then like, Hilo gets super crazy about it. But like, it would have been way more pushing, you know, like impactful on me if at least Wen had died or Anden had died, you know. Either one. I don't, I mean, or both even. It was, I just felt like the wind was taken out of my sails when that happened. Like, you know, when is dead, as soon as they show up, Andon rushes, grabs the jade and channels and restarts her heart. And, you know, she's in a coma and she's got the brain damage, so she's not maybe the same. But I feel like she will be by the next book. So I just, I felt like, oh man, if you could have just, just kill him, just say, you're dead. Then I think that would have had a lot of, it would have been a lot better for me, I think. Maybe not for everybody, but definitely for me. So let's see. What other scene did I like? Okay, just a couple more small things the, of the magic system that felt inconsistent to me. So sometimes they would talk about using strength to increase their speed. And in the first book, I was pretty sure they always used lightness to increase their speed. That was kind of like lightness was speed. You know, strength is just physical strength, which... Yeah, of course, I guess physical strength can make you move faster, but like, it always felt like lightness to me, but like, nobody uses lightness in this one, except to jump, which, fine, whatever. The, you know, steel could block channeling, which, you know, has happened in the other book and is fine, but I was just like, you know, you're channeling past that, like, you just, I always felt like stealing was more like blocking from the outside, and if channeling got in, you had to counter it with channeling um Ait killing the traitor in her clan that was a cool scene she walks in you're selling your company well no i would never sell my company i'm just a loyal man no you're selling it you're selling it to these guys we'll have 49 percent. they'll have 51 if they betray us they'll have zero percent and i'm going to kill you and all your family and he's like i'll sign anything just don't kill my family and she's like you can kill all your sons your wife and your daughters can go free and he accepts it and it's just like bam that's that's what I want from these kind of books. If I had a book of that kind of stuff, I would love it. So, you know, overall, I kind of give this one a two out of five. It's mainly just not for me. The writing is good. The story is good. The premise is good. It just never connected with me. If you like Jade City, you're going to love Jade War. I didn't. And that's all there is to say about it. So that's going to wrap up my discussion of Jade War second book in the Greenbone Saga by Fonda Lee. Thanks for listening. Thanks to David Hillowitz for the intro and outro music, of course. If you have any questions or comments or you think I'm way wrong on how good or bad Jade War is, you know, let me know. Send them to, send, you can send me an email at libromancypod at gmail.com. You know, please remember to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. That really helps us, uh, new people find it, the channel. And always remember to channel the magic of books.